Hello, I'm Lizelle Sambri. I'm a traditionally published author and welcome back to my channel. Today we are doing a Q&A. The last time I did a question and answer video was like seven months ago. I like looked it up just to see how long it had been since I had done one. So I figured it was about time. Um, I'm not this time around answering every single question. So sorry if I missed your question this time. I'm sure I'll be able to do another Q&A in a little while. And so you can ask again or things like that. Um, just because last time I answered every single question and the video was massive, so I'd like to not have it be that big this time. Um, yes, so not answering every question, but I'm getting to as many as I can. And I will be separating these into writing craft questions. So questions specifically about my writing process or things like that. And then questions about publishing. So questions that are about traditional publishing as an industry or publishing experiences, things like that, so that you can jump if you're interested in one or the other, or you can watch the whole thing, which would be great. So let's go ahead and get started. The first writing craft question is tips on writing multiple multiple POVs, please. So both my third and fourth book will have multiple points of views that are going to be coming out from Simon Schuster slash Margaret K. McElderry in 2023 and 2024, and they both have multiple POVs. Um, in these books, I will say one POV is clearly more dominant than the other. So I've not had like picked up to be published books where I've had, you know, the book is split in half between one POV and the other, or in which I've had like three or four or five POVs, for example. So I'm giving these tips based on the specific kind of multi POV experience I've had and feel confident about. And so the kind of two tips that I would give in regards to that would be trying to make your POVs as distinct as possible and making sure that they're necessary. So distinctiveness, I think this is something that's really important in multi POV books. Even if you do something like I do where I name the chapter after the character, um, it still matters that the voices are distinct because I've read books before where it's very clearly said which character its chapter is the chapter is and then I'm part way through the chapter and I pause and I'm like wait who am I reading from again and so it matters I think it's really important to have those distinct that distinction and also it matters because why do you have another POV if it's going to be exactly the same as the first POV it doesn't really make very much sense um, and it starts to feel less like a necessary character and more just kind of like the author's hand at work and you can tell that the second POV is just for plot reasons and so distinctiveness is important something that I do to kind of help me get distinctiveness is that I will pair two very different personalities and so the personalities of the characters are very different and so it's a lot easier to have them have distinct voices because they're not going to be the same so for example you know in butcher birds one pov is more kind of i guess seemingly quiet and reserved but also kind of like a little high key bitchy and that's she's a kind of melancholy and that's her voice whereas the other character is very confident very brash very forthright um and also older and so the way that she talks about certain things is different than the other character and then the second point i talked about is like making sure that they're necessary so that you're not just having a pov that isn't actually performing anything in the book um, and I think that's more a problem that you can get when you add more and more and more POVs um, and I think that's really up to the author to think of is this necessary for the story or am I just doing this for fun and it's fine if you're just doing it for fun kind of figure out a way that you can make it necessary to the story. Before you were a full-time writer, any tips slash stories for balancing life plus writing time? Uh, so I've been a f writing full-time since 2021, the beginning of 2021, though I was laid off for most of 2020. So I guess you could count that if you wanted to. But prior to all of that time in my life, basically, um, I was working a day job and then writing kind of on the side as a hobby in free time and things like that. And something that ended up really being helpful for me is that I would wake up early, which like 
I know for some people it really sucks and it like doesn't work for everyone, but what I would do is I would wake up early before I even went to work and I would sit down and I would get writing done and then I would go to work. And the reason I did that is because sometimes when I went to work, I wanted to do stuff with like friends after work and I wanted to be able to always know that my evenings were free so I wouldn't get into a situation where I like had writing to do that day and then my friend was like let's go to the movies and I would be like okay well I'm gonna go to the movies and then I wouldn't get the writing done um and I also had a very specific schedule so I set a schedule for myself so that I knew how many days I needed to get a certain amount of writing done and know that okay I have to do this every day or this however many days of the week um, and that also helped me track my time and make sure that I was getting consistent progress in my writing. Um, I didn't like to let myself just kind of decide when I was going to write because then I knew I probably wouldn't do it or I would do it so sporadically that I wouldn't really get anything done and I had specific goals about what I wanted to achieve. And I know some other people will kind of write in pockets of time um, that they have set aside. That's just kind of how it worked for me. It was really regimented. I woke up at like 5.36 um, and I sat down and I wrote for an hour, an hour and a half, and then I went to work and I did everything else. Um, I had previously done it sometimes where I would write in the evenings, but I find that I don't function super well in the evenings. And I preferred to just sacrifice sleep and then know that like I wasn't finishing a tired workday and then being like oh my gosh now I have to write like I'd start the day off strong with the writing and then I'd go through the rest so that was something I did for balancing um and something else really that was kind of it I really just found free time in which to kind of schedule in work um on my books and did it that way I got a couple questions about burnout with writing. Um, so feeling burnt out with writing and not really being able to write because of that or not really wanting to write because of that um, or struggles with mental or physical health as a result of writing. Um, and I struggled with how to answer this because for me personally, like the writing itself has never caused me to really have burnout. Um, when I, or like mental health struggles, I think when I've struggled with writing, it's never actually been writing. It's actually been publishing. When I was 18, I finished my first novel and I decided to query it and I heard nothing back. <laughs> and I pretty much right there went from like feeling really proud of finishing my book to being like, wow, I suck at this and I'm terrible. And then I wasn't starting university. And so it was really busy. And I just like the idea of trying to rewrite this novel that I had spent two years working on and like try that again while being in university for the first time, while doing all of my studies, while like having this like social life that I previously didn't have, it was like, it was overwhelming. And so I like, quite honestly, I dropped writing. I just decided that all the other things in my life were more important to me than writing. Um, and so I didn't do it <laughs> for two years. Um, so I never got to a burnout stage because I kind of preemptively dropped it. And then when I felt better, so I had had a couple years in university, I would gotten used to kind of balancing my workload. Um, I also ended up saving myself from school overwhelm because I realized I didn't need a minor. And so I realized if I dropped my minor, I could take creative writing classes and I could make writing a part of my life again. And so that was something I decided to do. I dropped my minor, it freed up my course load and into that course load, I put subjects that I would enjoy it. So I put in creative writing. I also taught, took an English class, things like that. Um, and so once I did that, I was able to get into writing again, but it didn't feel like there was as much pressure because I wasn't trying to become an author. I was just trying to force myself to write more regularly. And the way I could do that is I knew that I would have assignments. And so I would have to finish a short story and polish it and make it better because I was assigned it and I wanted to get a good grade and not like tank my GPA. And so it ended up 
even though I wasn't thinking of it consciously that way, it ended up being a lower pressure situation for me to continue to interact with writing and to get back into writing and to really fall in love with writing again, even though I wasn't thinking about it that way. I was just kind of like, well, now I have more time to write. And so to me, those were kind of two things was one, I like freed up a part of my life so that I had more time for writing. And I created a lower pressure situation for me to be able to enjoy writing. And so I've, you know, going on from there, once I kind of <laughs> went through university, I did short stories. And when I was in the working field and I was working and I no longer had things like homework, I had all of this free time. And I decided then to use that free time to write a book because I felt better and it was something I wanted to do. And that was the first book I'd written since that first book I tried to write um, back when I was 18. And I was 22 then because I did five years of school. I did a year of college as well. So that's kind of how that ended up working out for me. And so technically, if I think about it, I was like, I really did just take a long break from writing. I ended up taking a five year break from writing, essentially from writing to with the goal of being published. That's what I took a break from. And so to me, I don't think about it as like burnout or like severely affecting my mental health. It was just kind of like it was too much for me. And before I felt bad, I just kind of <laughs> chopped it off. Um, and to me, it didn't feel like, I mean, I, t I said I was giving up because I was dramatic, but I wasn't actually, I was just setting writing aside. And I think for some people that might work and that's what really worked for me. And then past that, I was able to, you know, continue working on writing. Um, but yeah, I've always kind of, when I feel myself getting overwhelmed or when I feel that writing is becoming too much, I've, Honestly, most of the time I've just stopped. I've <laughs> stopped doing it and I've given myself time. Um, I know that's not, you, that's easier said than done if you're in a situation where, for example, you're relying on relating, writing for your income or you're in a trad pub situation and you have deadlines. But even in traditional publishing with deadlines, you do always have the option to ask to have your deadline extended if you're really struggling. And so, I guess this is a very roundabout story and discussion to say that's kind of, I guess, how I handle that is I take breaks from it um, and I give myself time and sometimes I try out a different like low pressure, no pressure writing situation um, that takes me away from the writing situation that was super high pressure for me. How do you make your work stand out with the storylines, etc.? Because there's nothing new under the sun. Everything has been written before. Any topic you can think of, love to hear your thoughts coming from an aspiring writer. Thank you. So for me, this is an interesting question. I do like this question. For me, it's kind of a twofold thing. So one passively works and one I think is like an actual thing that can help other people. Um, so for me, perspective wise, a lot of the stories in traditional publishing that we have seen um, have not been written by black authors. Um, that's just kind of the way of publishing. And so for me, a lot of the times when I'm writing a story, a lot of black authors haven't really been given a shot to share that perspective on that story. So even if it's a story that's familiar, it's from a perspective that hasn't been seen as much. And so for me, kind of right off the bat with a lot of my story ideas, even if it kind of seems like something that may have been out there, I'm like, I can't even fill up one hand counting the amount of traditionally published Black authors that have gotten to share their version of this story. So that ends up kind of being part of it for me. And I think if you're a marginalized person, you'll probably have a similar experience because of the way that publishing has been for a very long time. Now, here's the twofold part of it. Um, so I really try and think about having a new spin on something that feels familiar. So I do agree that I think a lot of stories do feel familiar. They have certain familiar things about them um, or they can resemble a lot of different stories. And to me, it's about finding a way to put your own unique twist on it. Um, so, you know, there might be a lot of witch stories, for example, but are there a lot of witch stories about Black families living in near future Toronto's? <laughs> 
not so much. Um, and so that was kind of something that ended up standing out for me. And I did think about that. Like I thought it would be fun to set the book in the future, but it was also something that I hadn't really seen. I hadn't seen a lot of books that combined, you know, that took a witch book and added a sci-fi element to it. And so it felt fresher to me. And so I think about that a lot with my ideas, um, even if they sound familiar, I try and think about the bits and pieces that make it unique. And to me, that process of figuring out what makes something fresh or new or different often has me thinking about what is already out there, what I've already read, what I've seen announced or what I've seen floating around <laughs> and thinking about how I can add an element that I haven't really seen to that or how I can do a spin on it or sometimes how I can combine two things that maybe have been seen before but haven't necessarily been put together, um, which is I can also work in the case of Blood Like Magic about talking about witches and near future stories might be, you know, existing separately, common separately, um, but not often seen combined. And so that's kind of part of a process that I'll use as well to think about how something can be different. Now we are on to the publishing question. So the first question is, how many drafts should I finish before knowing my book is ready to query? There is no number. <laughs> there is no number. No More than one, actually. More than one. That I can say with absolute certainty, even if you are somehow the most amazing writer alive on the planet, not the first draft. <laughs> Um, please write more than one draft. But there isn't any specific number of drafts to get to the point. Like for me, the point at which you're ready to query is to do enough drafts as it needs. And sometimes, you know, for the case of Blood Like Magic, I did a time sort of thing. I was like, I'm going to do as many drafts as I need to in a year before I start querying this. But I did get to a point where it wasn't quite a year, but that draft, I couldn't see any way to make the book better. And I didn't think that sending it to a new round of beta readers to read was going to help make it better. I did truly feel that I had made it the best it could be. And so that's when I decided to start querying. But this is also why people recommend querying in rounds because, you know, maybe you thought it was the best it could be, but it wasn't actually quite ready yet. And so you query 10 agents. And if you don't hear anything back, um, you might send it to beta readers or critique partners or whatever, um, a new round of people to see if they have any feedback. And you might think, okay, if their feedback comes back and you're like, you know what, that is something I should change and fix and make better, then you can change and fix and make it better. And then you can query another 10 agents and go about it in that way. So there is definitely like no predetermined number of drafts um, to do until you're ready to query. Um, it's just a case of knowing that your book is ready, um, except more than one more than one. This one is really interesting. So what do you think is the one thing relating to the story you queried to get an agent about your story that got you your agent? In other words, what caught your agent's interest? I can't know. <laughs> but from what I recall of being on the call with my agent, being on the call with Christy is the big thing that she talked about in the compliment and what she had mentioned was the voice the voice of the character and that how that really drew her in. And when we've worked on future projects together, she's always talked about the voice and she has previously said like, I know things written in your voice will be great because you have a fantastic voice for your characters. And that's also a compliment I've gotten from my editor as well about my stories is how she really likes the voice. So I guess that's what I would point to if I was going to pick a single thing, um, which I think is interesting to think about because, you know, I think in traditional publishing, you think a lot about the sellability of the idea and like really like juicy, um, hot hooks and things like that, which is not to say that I don't think Blood Like Magic has a great hook because I do think it has a great hook. Um, but it's interesting to me that what I've been told has stood out has been the voice. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say it is. <laughs> what did you wish you knew before starting your publishing journey? 
I wish I knew <laughs> that an advance is not a prediction of your book's success. And I'm not sure if I've said this in a Q&A before, because as I'm saying this answer, it's feeling familiar. Um, but I'll reiterate it in this Q&A. <laughs> an advance is not a prediction of your book's future success. Um, I think I would have saved myself some like stress and mental anguish and heartache. Um, and the more I am entrenched in the industry, the more that proves itself to be true um, because publishers sometimes do this interesting thing where they will throw a bunch of money at a title and give it a really big advance and then they don't market it for some reason and then the book doesn't do well um it's a very weird thing and then also there are lots of books that will get modest advances that will do very very well and exceed expectations um this is not like a regular occurrence all around either of those but they are things that happen and so the advance is your publisher's really best guess of how they think your book will perform and it's affected by other factors such as if you have other offers such as if you have a good agent who is able to negotiate for you or if you have maybe a like agent that doesn't really negotiate for you and so the publisher might get away with <laughs> offering you know a smaller amount than they might have like come up to if an agent had pushed a little bit more um or if you have an agent with more connections or less connections things like that and so there are lots of things that affect advances um but they're all guesses <laughs> And so they're not predictions. And so, you know, don't decide based on your advance how you think your book is going to do because it is not necessarily reality. And that goes both ways for advances that are very high and advances that are more modest. So that's something I wish I knew. <laughs> Because I think it it not only saves, you know, heartbreak if you're an author that got a modest advance and you think, oh, well, now my book is going to not do very well. It also saves heartache if you're an author that gets a huge advance and you think, wow, my book is going to do amazing. And then you get to the finish line and you're shocked and you're confused because your publisher is saying, oh, we don't really want to pick up your first book, your sales on the first one, your next book, your sales on the first one weren't good. And you're wondering, well, why how did that happen because I was supposed to do really well because you paid me a lot. So yeah, goes both ways. Good thing to know about the industry. So I got a couple questions about, um, do I plan on being a full-time writer forever? Do I want to switch to part-time at some point? What are kind of my career plans in that way? And so for me, <laughs> I would like to be able to write full-time forever. That would be my dream. That would be my goal. And it is my goal. Um, but, you know, I'm always open and willing to, if I financially needed to go back to having a day job, then I would go back to having a day job because I do need to eat and live and so on. And so I'm very open to that. I've never really felt like I, you know, need to super struggle bus um, to continue being a full-time author. Um, if needs be, I would go back to working a day job, but it is my hope that I will not and I can continue writing full-time. I am... Um, I think for me, it's kind of deciding how I want that full-time author career to look um, and how I would like that to be. I think right now, at least for this year, even though not all are announced, I'm doing like a number of writing projects in order to, you know, be able to continue to write full time. And I think I'd like it if in the future I could do a little bit less per year. I think ideally I'd really like to be able to work on one, um, maybe two full length books per year on contract. Um, but probably more like one per year. I think that would be my interest <laughs> instead of like many multiples, um, just because I think it'll give me the ability to focus and the time to focus. Um, and it's just kind of whether at this point, whether that financially works out for me or not, but that would be my ideal. And like, I would be fine with doing multiple anthologies or things like that or short story contributions I would be comfortable with that as well and like getting to write in different age categories would be great I do really want to be able to write an adult book one day well I've written an adult book publish an adult book one day I would like to do that um and yeah and 
that's kind of my interests. Um, I think I've dabbled in like maybe one day wanting to like do some sort of teaching things, but then I'm like, eh, do I actually want to do that or not? <laughs> I think that's back and forth on that. Um, but yeah, I think that would definitely be my ideal. And I think it would give me a lot more room to take on more ambitious projects because I would know that I was just focusing on one project for the whole year. And because of the speed at which I write, um, that meant I could do spend a lot more time doing research, things like that, um, and like devoting more time to that. So that's kind of how I would like my writing career to look like. It would also be like, nice to have events to go to. That would be really great. Um, but that's kind of an up in the air thing that I don't have like a lot of control of. I also don't have a lot of control of like, well, I sign contracts, so I decide if I want to write a book in that year. But, you know, it'd be nice to be able to financially support myself just working on one contracted book per year. Editing Lizella here, I just wanted to pop in and clarify because I wasn't sure if it was clear in that last clip, but what I mean is that I am working on multiple projects in a year. All of those projects are things that I'm really excited about and really happy to be working on. I don't take on projects that I'm not interested in. And I have in fact turned down a project before um, because I just wasn't interested in it. And what I'm talking about when I mean being able, having it be financially viable for me to work on one project a year is not that I wouldn't be doing those other projects, but rather that the spread of them would be different. So for example, I'm doing multiple projects in one year because I need those advance payments and things like that to add up to a viable annual income. But if the advance for one project or the royalties or whatever I was getting paid for various things was enough that I could just work on one project that year, I would just spread the other projects out more. I would request to have that happen before I signed a contract. And so that's kind of how it would be. So not that I wouldn't be working on the things I'm working on now, just that the spread of them would be different than it is now. So that's what I meant. And when I'm talking about changing the spread of things, so asking for different dates or things like that. I am talking about in cases in which projects are coming to the author, which is something that can happen in traditional publishing for different projects. And of course, in the case of projects that would come from me, so things that I would be trying to sell, um, I would change the spread of that as well to push it over to a different year instead of trying to do it in one year. Um, and the same with the case of the Canada Arts Grant, I might skip applying to the Canada arts grant one year and push that to another year so I could focus solely on that project that I've been given a grant for instead of having those multiple things in one year. But no shade to authors who are writing things that maybe they don't necessarily like because they need to live and eat and survive. I'm not going to judge that. Um, I feel like sometimes in the arts people are very precious about those sorts of things. And they're like, no, this should be your passion. But there are so many other jobs where we don't require that at all. Um, and so I'm definitely not gonna be on my high horse over here. And I am in a very privileged position in which I can turn down projects that I'm not interested in and still be financially okay and still write full time. And this last question is, is getting a writing degree really necessary? So in my experience, for people I know writing adult, young adult, and middle grade fiction, no, absolutely not. Not required at all. I do not have a writing degree at all. Um, I took some English courses um, and some like creative writing courses, but that was not my major. I majored in linguistics, which is essentially like language math. It is not an English degree by any means or a writing degree. Um, and I'm a traditionally published author. Um, I have many friends who did not go to school for writing and are traditionally published authors. Um, I'm not sure about things like nonfiction. That's really not my area of expertise, so I can't really think on it. But I do know there are people who have written nonfiction books who have not been like had not had literature degrees, but I guess it depends what sort of like nonfiction you're writing potentially. So I don't really know about nonfiction, so I won't say anything about that. But in the case of fiction in all age categories, no, not at all necessary for traditional publishing. 
and in self-publishing you are controlling it so unless you yourself are deciding that you can't write because you don't have an English literature degree or writing degree you can publish and it will happen for you and you can be an author. And that's it for this Q&A. Um, I hope this was helpful to you again. I'm sorry that I couldn't get to everyone's questions but I tried to answer as many as I could and hopefully that was helpful or entertaining or whatnot for you. <laughs> if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and if you haven't subscribed already please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching! Bye!